How are you guys doing tonight? God bless y'all for coming back to church and wanting to dive into the deep end of the pool. I trust that you'll make it out. Tonight we're going to be uh, addressing a subject that really, despite the fact that we've got Assemblies of God written all over our billboard in the front of the church and uh, that we're supposed to be Pentecostal folks, we really don't do a whole lot of talking about it anymore. I think we kind of got scared into silence because folks complain that we talk too much about this business of the Holy Spirit. How many of you know that that's one-third of the Trinity? We do love God the Father. We are saved by God the Son. And we are absolutely empowered by God the Holy Spirit. We don't have to hold back or, or, or um, uh, be ashamed of, of anything like that. I'll tell you this, the Bible makes a big deal out of it. And, and if you look statistically at, at, at Scripture, you'll find that two, there are two major statistical spikes on references to Spirit, Spirit of God, Holy Spirit, Spirit of Truth, that kind of thing, and that is Paul and anything that Paul's involved in, all of his writings, and then in Luke. And there's a direct connection there too because Luke is one of the main disciples of Paul. Water still runs downhill today. It was running downhill there too from mentor to mentee, from teacher to disciple. And so you get two major spikes in the New Testament on this emphasis um, uh, on the Holy Spirit, and that's Paul and Luke. So I'd say we're in pretty good company tonight, huh? All right, um, you're able to see living all, living all of life empowered by the Holy Spirit. So let's just dive in. Um, the Holy Spirit empowers us to become children of God. This is something that everybody, even your denominational friends, ought to be comfortable with because we're, we're told this is what the Spirit of God does. The Spirit of God um, introduces us to Jesus. And the Spirit of God is involved in the process of us becoming sons and, and daughters of God. You, and there's absolutely nothing wrong with that, but there's a very important point that I want to make at the end. In John chapter 16, verse 8, this is what we're told about us becoming children of God. The Holy Spirit will convict us of sin. Did you know that you can't convict yourself? You can have a guilty conscience, but in order to be truly convicted, you are, that's a work of the Holy Spirit in your life. He tells you there are things in your life that are not pleasing to God. And, and then he, he works with you, he woos you in the direction of God, and, and he empowers you to overcome. We're going to see texts that refer to this, to overcome those temptations or habits or, or whatever, and the Spirit enables us to repent, and in that, in that flashpoint, then we receive forgiveness from God the Father, and we become, we get adopted into his family, we become his children. So absolutely, before we are saved, the Holy Spirit is already active in our lives. He's the one who woos us, convicts us, enables us to repent, um, and lead us in the direction of new life in Jesus. In John chapter 1 verse 12, it says, as many as received Jesus, he gave them the power to become the children of God. This is really important. This is the Spirit of God being involved in our um, regeneration, changing of natures from the old to the new. In John chapter 3, John talks about the Spirit, the wind blows where it wants, so it is also with the Spirit and everyone who is born of the Spirit of God. So the Holy Spirit is absolutely active in this work of regeneration. We call it getting saved, being born again. There's all kinds of different ways to refer to this process of new birth into a new family with a new father and a new nature. The Spirit of God, no doubt about it, is absolutely involved in every step along that continuum along that process. Um, I think this is an incorrect reference. If you'll take John out, if you're taking notes, and put Romans. This is Romans chapter 8 verse 9. 
If anyone do, doesn't have the spirit of Christ, he doesn't belong to him. Now, the reason that I threw this slide, this text in there, is it, in, it gives us an opportunity to talk about, well, what about people who, you know, are raised in another denomination? I have a very good Lutheran friend, and they really love God and that kind of thing. Is it true that if they're not Pentecostal and they're not baptized in the Holy Spirit, they don't, quote, have the Holy Spirit? Well, this text right here is telling us if you don't have the Spirit of Christ, you don't belong to him. That would mean that all of our Baptist, all of our Methodist, all of our Episcopal, all of our Anglican, all of our Presbyterian, none of them are saved. They're not right with God. But that's not what this text is saying, and that's not what the Bible teaches. The Spirit of God is involved in a person's life even before they're saved. We already established that. The Spirit not the Father, not the Son, but God the Holy Spirit convicts us of our sin. That's the way we start on our process, our journey toward Jesus. So is the Holy Spirit involved, active in? Um, do people who are non-Pentecostal people, if they claim, if, if they're living a life of obedience to Jesus, where Jesus is Lord of their lives, they're absolutely saved. It's not the question. See, the issue is, and this is the reason why I put this first little section in so we could talk about the Spirit's involvement in the process of salvation or new birth or regeneration. The Spirit of God is involved in those people's lives. Thank God for that. For many of us, probably most of us, there's a lag time between when you are saved and when you're filled with the Spirit. Is the Spirit of God not there? Is, is He not involved at all? No, he was involved before you're saved, as in the process of you becoming saved, and then after you're saved, the Holy Spirit is involved there. The Holy Spirit simply has different aspects of his portfolio. One of them is to be involved in this action of regeneration or new birth. But I've got some news for my uh, uh, denominational friends, and that is, that's not the only part of his portfolio. I could take you all the way back to the book of Genesis in chapter 1, and the Spirit of God was hovering on the face of the deep. The Spirit of God was involved in creation. There are other things that he's involved in, other responsibilities that God the Holy Spirit has. This is an important one. I don't diminish it at all. If, if, we couldn't, if we could never get on the train, if we could never get right with God, if we could never be born into this uh, new covenant that we're a part of, then all of the rest of it is wood, hay, and stubble. All the rest of it is of no effect. It, it, the Spirit of God is absolutely involved in the process of our becoming right with God, but that's not all that He does. That's not the end of His work in our lives. Paul says in Ephesians chapter 5 that uh, we're not to be drunk with or even, you could say, filled up to the full and overflowing with wine because that is dissipation. That's excess. Rather, he says, be constantly filled. The word is in the, the present passive indicative in Greek. And Greek has a very elaborate verb system that is very specific in terms of its intentions. Hebrew, on the other hand, is very non-specific, and you have to be very careful with Hebrew verbs. It's not a very well-developed verb system. Greek has a present active indicative and a present passive indicative, and what that means is it is continuous action, and if it's passive, that means somebody else is doing it, not you. So he's saying, be continually filled by God with the Holy Spirit of God on a constant overflowing basis. Now, I'm going to make a point at the very end of this discussion, and this is what this really is. It's not a sermon. It's a Bible study. So if you came to hear a sermon, sorry. We'll just stand up here, mess around, do our best. Be constantly filled with the Holy Spirit. Do you know that the modern Pentecostal church has a doctrine that's much like Baptist Presbyterians and others? Once saved, always saved. You've heard that before. We've kind of started practicing once filled, always filled. 
You get it at youth camp, you get it at revival, you get it in, at, at, at some brush arbor meeting, some tent revival, and supposedly, according to the practice of many modern day Pentecostals, that means you're good to go. That's kind of like one of those cars that they're making now. What do they call it? The Volt, right? You're not supposed to have to fill up with uh, gas, but most cars, you got to fill up every so often. Gas runs out. Tanks run dry. Sometimes batteries need to be recharged. How many of you guys know that we have this treasure, Paul says, in earthen vessels? You're aware of that, right? Earthen vessels. What that means is, if we put this in modern day terminology, um, you know the Tupperware that we keep stuff in the refrigerator in? Well, sometimes the freezer works its magic and those things break. They crack. They wear out. The lids don't uh, fit. Uh, uh, the lids won't snap. Earthen vessels get leaky. They get broken. They get sloshed around in the everyday affairs of life, right? Things happen. Life happens. God knows this. And he knows that one filling is not good enough. He knows that it's not a once filled, always saved world that he has brought you into in the body of Christ. There is a constant need for all of us, from the least of us to the greatest of us and everybody in between, there's a constant need to be refilled by the Holy Spirit. And I'm going to return to that point at the end of this, whatever this is. Point number two, section number two. Yes, of course, the Holy Spirit is involved in the process of salvation. But the Holy Spirit is also involved in the process of transformation. Paul says, don't be conformed to the world's schematized, is the Greek word. Don't, be, don't get pushed into the same schematic that everybody else is in over the, uh, in the rest of the world. He's saying, don't become a spiritual limbing. Don't become a cookie cutter. Let God instead transform you. Radically metamorphosize your very being. And the word there is met metamorpheo, to be transformed. It's like the difference between the egg and the larva, between the larva and the caterpillar, between the caterpillar and the beautiful butterfly at the end of the process. Be radically transformed by the renewing of your mind. And so we're going to talk for a moment about the spirit of God's work in transforming our lives. Um, we are told by our culture, I'll just use Oprah for example, I'm not sure where you stand, but I'm kind of glad she went away. Okay? I was pretty much, when, when she told us that there can't just be one way to God, Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, the life. No man comes to the Father except by me. Oprah said there can't be more, there can't be only one way to God. There has to be literally thousands of ways to God. I was done with Oprah at that point. So you make your own call, that's where I live and move and have my being. But the point is this, the point is this, God is not interested in radical makeovers like Oprah style, your 12-step program, just you becoming a better person. God is interested in getting on the inside of you and literally changing your nature, my nature, our nature. God is not interested in us going through some kind of a makeover and having before and after pictures shown to the rest of the crowd. God wants to change us from the inside out all the way down to our toenails. God wants us radically transformed by the power of his spirit working in us. Okay, there's that text that we saw already in John 1.12. He gave them power to become the children of God. Take a look at this. In 1 Samuel, in an Old Testament text, you hear about the spirit of God coming on a person and then they're going to prophesy. That, more on that in a moment about this business of uh, spirit empowerment or spirit baptism, and immediately following is spirit-inspired speech. But I don't want to talk about that right now. I want to talk about this last part of the verse. You shall prophesy to them and be changed into another man. Radical transformation. Old Testament style. All the way back in the days of David, Samuel, and Saul. This is going on. Changed into another man. 
the book of Ezekiel, another Old Testament text. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to observe my ordin ordinances. That's just another way of saying, ladies and gentlemen, listen to me. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. That's what Jesus said in John chapter 14. If you love me, then you'll keep my commandments. If your life has been radically changed by my love and my power and my sacrifice, it's going to result in, an, in, in a change in the way you walk, in the way you talk, in the way that you live your everyday lives. God is going to bring us to a point where we absolutely, from the core of our being, we want to obey him. And that is not a part of natural man. That's not just a part of the inborn nature that we get at birth, at, at natural, physical childbirth. We don't just come into this world, busting this world wide open, wanting to love and obey God and be conformed to his will. It's not, not a part of, the, part of the program. But when God gets a hold of us, he starts changing our nature. He starts changing our desires. And we desire to do his will. We want to make him delight in our behaviors and in our attitudes, in our conversations, in our actions, when they begin to conform to his will and his ways. Romans chapter 8. If the spirit who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he's going to give, look at the underlying portion, he's going to give life to your mortal bodies. Are we still talking about new birth here? And I'd suggest not because the book of Romans was written to Christians. Simple fact, just often overlooked by us as well as by our denominational friends. Paul is writing these letters when he's saying to the Ephesian church, don't be drunk with wine, but rather be filled with the Holy Spirit. He's telling that, I have a secret to let you in on that you can let your friends on. He's telling that to people who are already Christians. He's not evangelizing in the book of Ephesians. He's instructing the body of Christ. Exactly. Thank you very much. He will, this spirit of God is going to infuse your life with new strength and power. You have life to your mortal bodies. Verse 13. And if by the Spirit you are putting to death the deeds of the body, then you will live. I've got great news for you guys. Um, any of you who are currently or who have ever been under temptation, I'm not even saying that you've given in to it. I wonder if there's anybody in that category, Pastor. Everybody. We've all been under temptation. We all will be under temptation. Here's the promise in Romans chapter 8, verse 13. The Spirit of God will empower us to overcome temptation, to live above temptation, to not yield to temptation. Instead of yielding to the desires of our flesh, the Spirit of God is going to empower us to give heed to the desires of God for our lives. Paul will say in other places, one leads to death, the other leads to life. Can you figure out which is which? It's not difficult, is it? Part of the Spirit of God's responsibility then is not just to see people saved, but also to see people empowered to the point that they are able to live victoriously over sin. That's good news, guys. That is real good news. That's saying <coughs> we are not out here flailing around on our own. God hasn't just saved us and said, okay, now the rest is up to you. I actually worked for a guy. I'm almost ashamed to say it. I actually worked for a guy for many years, president of a Bible college, who would regularly say in our chapel services, now brothers and sisters, I know that God saved you by his grace, but after that, it's up to you. That's bad news. And it's not true. I'm glad it's not true. I'm glad the reality is God gets in. He is in our corner. You know, Rocky Balboa, he is in our corner. He is pitching for us. He wants to see us succeed. To see us succeed. He wants to see us obey. Because with the, in the, if we walk through the gate of obedience, 
<coughs> then we walk into through, in, through the gates of blessing. He wants us to live in blessing. He wants us to be in right relationship with him. He doesn't want us to be cannon fodder for the devil. He doesn't want us to walk around condemned. He wants us walking in abundance and newness of life. He wants us empowered by his spirit so that not by our own willpower, at least not exclusively, not by us just pulling up our own bootstraps, just gritting it out day by day, putting our nose to the same grindstone. No, he wants his people empowered by the Holy Spirit, not so we just barely get by, just, oh man, I just barely skirted that sin but to walk in true victory over that thing. It's by the Spirit, the power of God's Holy Spirit, taking up His residence on the inside of us, that we get empowered, get enabled, get infused, so that we, by His strength, not by our weakness, by our striving, by His strength, that we are able to live victoriously over whatever is tempting us. 1 Corinthians, you were washed. We can call that salvation. You want to call it that? That sounds about right. Washed, cleansed of our sin, whiter than snow. But look at what Paul does in this very, in just this one passage. That's not where the end of the Holy Spirit's work shows up. You were made holy. Another way of saying that is the old word, you were sanctified. You were justified, and that's a technical legal term. It was used in Paul's day, it's used even today. It means when all of the evidence is presented, then the judge looks at all of the evidence, he bangs the gavel on his rostrum, and he declares the person who has been charged not guilty, in fact, innocent of all wrongdoing, and now because you stand innocent of all wrongdoing, you are in right standing with God. Holy Spirit's doing that. He's working that in us. You were washed, made holy, justified in right standing in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the Spirit of our God. Do you see that? The Holy Spirit's only involved in regeneration. Wrong. Right? I get to give pop quizzes. I'm a professor. It's totally legal. Second Corinthians 3. We all with unveiled face, as in a mirror, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into that same image. The, the image of what? Into what image? What image are we being transformed into? It's, it's right here in the text. It's we're beholding the glory of the Lord. We're being transformed into that image. The image of the glory of the Lord. Or the image of the Lord himself. And we're going from glory to glory. From stage to stage. Step to step. One, one plateau to the next plateau. In what way? By our striving? Just because we're good looking? Because our wife wants us to be? No, it's, it, this comes... By the work of the Spirit in our lives. Do you see it at the end of the verse? Got to love that. You got to love it. God is, in our, is, is on our team. Or rather, he, we're on His. God is for us, not against us. God wants to see us changed. He wants to see us becoming, entering into this process where we're becoming more and more like Jesus all the time. And it works in this way, not just by us doing our daily devotions. Oh yeah, we can make ourselves available. I mean, if you want to go to the, watch the ball game, you've got to go to the ball game, right? But God's the one buying the ticket and letting us in. Giving us the sight, giving us the hearing, giving us the ability to take it all in. God is empowering us to be involved in this transformational this change kind of process. This comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. Paul says, walk by the Spirit and you won't carry out the desires of the flesh. If we are walking in the empowerment of God's Spirit, then we are going to be producing the fruit of the Spirit, and those are delineated in the same passage, Galatians chapter 5, as opposed to walking in the flesh and producing the fruits of the flesh. 
part of which is death. This really is pretty simple. It's, it, it's almost scary it's so simple. Have you ever noticed that in Christianity, there's this, um, among Christian preachers and teachers, there's this tendency to want to take simple things and make them difficult? I rebuke that in Jesus' name. I don't know that it's going to change anything, but I do it anyway. I rebuke that in Jesus' That's ridiculous. That, that's not art. That, that, that's not um, transformative teaching. It's something, but it's not good. This is relatively simple. If we sow in one field, we reap the crop from that field. Yes? So in another field, a different kind of seed, we reap a different kind of crop. I can understand that. Galatians chapter 3. Are you so foolish, having begun by the Spirit? Note that Paul is hearkening all the way back to their, their involvement or their touch, the touch of the Spirit on their lives before they're, before they're even saved. And then working through that salvation process and now through this transformation process. And Paul's saying the Spirit of God has got to be intimately involved in every aspect of your lives all the way through to the end of your life. Have you begun by the Spirit and now you're ending up being completed, being perfected in the flesh? Nah, it doesn't work like that. It's the work of the Spirit to complete to mold, to transform, to empower, to overcome sin, to change, to radicalize. And this is a lifelong process. It doesn't start by the Spirit of God being allowed His way until we get saved and get right with God. And then after that, oh well, you know what, after that, that's it for me with, with me and the Spirit. I mean, even the word, the old word, Holy Ghost, that's just a spooky kind of thing. That's something that I just, I, I don't know that I really want, want any part of. Let me tell you something, lady. Let me tell you something, gentlemen. If you're right with God, if you're saved, the Spirit of God's already been active in your life. We already looked at that. We've already demonstrated that. Let him have his way from now until the last breath, until the last heartbeat. Let him have his way. Let him continue to work what he began at the beginning of your walk with God and continue that until you are ready to meet your maker and until your, the work is complete in your life. Zechariah chapter 4. I don't mean to be jumping back and forth between uh, testaments, but in one respect it's all good because it's all God's word. It is not by might. It is not by power. And these are words, koach and chayil in Hebrew, that are uh, usually representative of human ability. Um, some kind of strength on the battlefield or the kind of strength that Samson had when he pushed the temple down or, you know, those kinds of acts of, of, of human strength. It is not about human strength, but it is by his spirit, says the Lord. Um, there's only so much endurance that we have in our human um, frame to be able to resist the enemy, to be able to resist temptation, to be able to resist the, the, the desires of our flesh that are unhealthy, then there's this inexhaustible power of the Spirit of God that can, be, that can be tapped into, that is available for us, that God wants to pour into our lives to empower us and enable us. It's not just about our own willpower or about our ability to make successful or effective New Year's resolutions or if we hold our mouth just right or we get the right Aramaic voice inflection in our prayers. It is not about us. It's about Him empowering us to be the kind of people He's called us to be. And we talked about that some this morning. The law came through Moses, the Gospel of John says. But grace came through Jesus Christ. And I'll talk to you for just a minute about that word grace. The word grace in Greek, this is a Greek text because it's in the New Testament. The word grace is the Greek word charis. I want you to say it for me. I'm going to act like a TV preacher now. God help me. Charis. Do, do you know any words that, uh, that that's a part of in English? Let's ground it in English real quick. Charis. C-H-A-R-I-S. Charismatic. There it is. Or charisma. Um, it um, means a, a bunch of different things in the Bible depending on the context that it's found. 
You, the words are defined by context, not by dictionary definitions. So sometimes in our world, the word grace, it means something that you say before you eat, right? In other contexts, the word grace means having good manners, kind of like Emily Post, right? And in another uh, situation, let's take gymnastics, for example, because we're kind of ramping up to Olympics, right? And uh, when people are talked about being graceful, graceful, it means filled with grace. It means that they have lots of coordination. So there are a bunch of different ways that this word grace or this word charis in, in Greek can be used in many instances, in lots of instances in the Bible, it means none of that. Instead, it means charis. It means God's enabling power. God's power that he infuses into human beings. Charis. And the reason, here's the way I can prove it to you. Go to and read a bunch of Bible texts and try to insert those other things. Somebody being mannerly. Somebody being coordinated. Somebody saying words of uh, blessing or thanksgiving in a prayer over um, uh, a meal. Try to insert those definitions into places where the Bible uses the word grace and you'll go, well, that doesn't make any sense. Trust that. You have common sense. It's not so common anymore, but God gives it to all of us. God gives us common sense. Part of that common sense is in this business of communication. <laughs> and so if you plug a definition into where the, the Bible say, uses the word grace um, and it makes no sense at all, try this one, God's enabling power. Take a look at this passage, for example. The law came through Moses, but God's charis, that's what the Greek says, came through Jesus. Is that passage saying, well, the law gave, Moses gave, but when Jesus came, he taught us how to pray over our food. It's stupid, right? That's just goofy. God's law, his, his statutes, commandments, and ordinances came through Moses, but his ability to um, uh, get tin on the balance beam came through Jesus. Is equally stupid, right? Um, let's try one more. The, the, the commandments, statutes, and ordinances came through Moses, but um, God gave us the ability to be good hosts and hostesses and exercise good manners when people come over our house or when we go to a party. It's just dumb. Yes? Okay, so let's try this on. What God expected, he spoke through Moses. When Jesus came, and you know what happened after that, right? pastor quoted that passage this morning. Jesus said, it is necessary that I leave. If I don't, then the Holy Spirit won't be poured out. But when I leave, I'm not leaving you as orphans. God is going to pour his Holy Spirit out on you, and you are going to do amazing things. Amazing things. So try this out. God's expectations were laid down by Moses. God's enabling power to live up to those expectations came not through the giving of the law, but through the giving of the Son. Whoo! Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Again, that's telling us that when God calls us to live a certain way, He is not going to leave it up to our devices and our good looks and our best intentions and our creativity to live up to that. He is going to enable us. He's going to empower us to walk out whatever he puts on our plate. I got to buy the way for you. God is almost never going to call you to something that you're just absolutely comfortable with. Yep, that's just right in my wheelhouse. Yes, I've been doing that all of my life and I'm totally comfortable with that. God is going to get you out of your comfort zone because he is more interested in you being conformed to his image than he is in you being comfortable. He just is. He loves us that way. It's like my dad, when he taught me how to ride a bike, he, got, he grabbed the handlebars with one hand, he grabbed the seat with the other hand, he got me going, and then what did he do? Did he do the same thing with you? Right? Yep. He let go. Right? Um, God wants to get us so far out on a limb. This is his ideal for us. 
that the only option we have is to trust him. Why is that? Because he's just mean that way? No, because that's where we grow. When we see those everlasting arms holding us up, we grow. We grow in trust. We grow in relationship. And, and, and each time, he's going to nudge us out just a little bit more out on that limb, just a little bit further, just a little bit further. Because he loves us like that. He wants to see his children grow. Isn't that what a good dad would want to do? That's what all of us do. Yeah, we're not going to hold our children back. We want to see our kids experience new things, develop new abilities, conquer new cities, um, overcome um, uh, fears and questions, doubts that we have had before. And so God is going to do that in our lives. He simply does that. And when he gets us out on that limb... And we get to the point where we know we're not going to make it on our own. What do we do? Father, help. I'm in a vulnerable situation. I have needs that my ingenuity, that, 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 that my resources simply aren't sufficient to satisfy. I need for your inestimable power to break in here. I need for your um, divine enablement to overcome temptation, to resist the enemy, to overcome the weaknesses of my flesh, to overcome um, fears like when I was in the 7th or 8th grade, I stayed after class after I had failed miserably at a dumb three-minute speech because I dropped the cue cards and I I forgot to number them and when I picked them up, they were all out of order total crash and burn situation and I stayed behind class that day everybody left and I said Mrs. whatever her name was you can send me to the principal you can spank me they used to do that back in the good old days you can you can put me in in a study hall a detention hall you can kick me out of school but let me just tell you this I will never speak in front of another group of human beings again as long as I live I'm just here to tell you, this is not me up here. The real me is over there in the corner with a book. And my wife will tell you the exact same thing, and she tells the truth better than I do. I am introverted. I am interested in going to a party and talking to one person about one subject the entire time, getting in the car, going home, and saying, thank you very much, leave me alone. Um... I, I'm not a gregarious, kind of out there, woo kind of personality. But God has done something. And God is in the business of doing these kinds of somethings. He's not going to call us to stuff that we can do in our own strength. Who gets the glory if, that, if anything good comes out of that situation? Us, you, me. But what is God always wanting to do? Glorify his great name in all of the earth. So he's constantly going to be calling us to stuff outside of our comfort zone and then caressing us, infusing us with his enabling power so that whatever happens, it's totally on his shekel. It it ends up on his ledger, on his account. And then his great name is glorified in all the earth. Everybody has a good day and people see God for who he is, and then we all, we all go home more enlightened. That, that's a good day at the office. 1 Corinthians 13. Paul spe- says, if I speak in the tongue of men and angels, but I don't have love, then I'm basically, I'm skipping to the very end of the passage there. If I don't have love, faith like to move mountains. If I don't have love, I'm nothing. This empowerment of the Holy Spirit enables you to love the unlovable, enables you to move in, a, um, in an attitude of grace toward other people where if you, were, if you were going simply by your own human limitations, you would have left them, rejected them, neglected them, look, overlooked them a long time ago, miles and miles back. God is saying, I am able to inject a love into you that will take you places that you never dreamed. Guess what? This is true in marriage. 
This is not just about strangers, about homeless people or whatever. This is about people in the body of Christ. This is about folks that you've gotten sideways with in your own family. This is about your husband or your wife. The power of God, if you'll open up to it, he'll do it. Oh yes, he will fill every empty vessel. That's what the song says. That's what the story in the life of Elijah the prophet says. The oil didn't stop flowing until the last empty vessel was filled up. He'll fill every empty vessel. If you are running on empty in your marriage, <laughs> I've, got a, I've got a story for you. I've got a secret for you. It's not in going to the next marriage enrichment seminar. Sorry, just isn't that easy. It's like we ought to start Christian drive through McDonald's kind of things. Just have people run through in their cars, pop each one of them on the forehead, cast everything out that's not supposed to be in there, cast in everything, and then we're all good to go. Microwave religion, done. Magic pill. I give you a magic pill. Fix everything. God doesn't work like that. I will empower you to love like you have never loved before. I'm not talking about just on your honeymoon. I'm talking about a kind of love that grows day by day, that deepens day by day, that, that enables you to pour yourself out into the service and ministry of another human being, your wife, your husband. Um, for those who haven't experienced that, I'm just, I'm, I don't mean to sound elitist. This is just the reality. I feel sorry for you. And for those who are not living abundant life that we talked about this morning in the area of marriage, I feel sorry for you because God has that for you. It's right there. It's like low-hanging fruit. It's right there for the taking and, um, and, and you haven't walked into it. You haven't experienced it. That's a bummer. That, that's, that's like winning the lottery and nobody bothering to tell you about it. You know what I'm saying? Um, Please, for the love of God, no pun intended, um, for the love of God, get into this. this. This Holy Spirit empowerment to love in a capacity that takes you well beyond your human capability. That's what God does. That's what he's all about. It, it is the miraculous. <clears throat> and it works in marriage as much as it works in outreaching unbelievers going to other countries and building Bible colleges. Yeah, all of that stuff is love. But, um, boy, it's great when, it's, when you got it going on at home. And it's reciprocal. All that love that you're pouring in, you start getting that stuff back. You really do reap what you sow. Um, start sowing to the good. Start sowing to deference. Start sowing to dead to self. Start sowing to uh, preferring the other's desires uh, over you. Start pouring yourself out in servant love to somebody else. Pouring yourself into supporting, loving, encouraging, undergirding, um, and uh, believing in, um, and hoping the best for, and wanting to see that other person optimally satisfied and happy and, and fulfilled and stuff. Watch the blessings start rolling back in. Just watch. But it doesn't come by saying, you know what? I'm going to make a New Year's resolution. This next year, I'm going to be a better husband. Really? Good luck with that. Get back to me in about six months. Let's see how that program's going. The power of God makes all the difference. It is the life changer. Open up. Tell him, it's not inside of me. Whatever it was that we had at the beginning, it, it's gone, God. And, and I, I, I just can't seem to get it back. No, you can't. But he will pour a love into you for that love of your life that he put into your life to start with. And you will go places in that relationship that you have never dreamed, never allowed yourself to even think possible. If I don't have love, I'm nothing. It's a work of the Spirit. <clears throat> The Holy Spirit inspires us or empowers us, enables us to pray, to pray. A lot of, I don't know of many Christians who don't struggle with their, quote, prayer life, okay? We're busy. There's a whole lot of responsibilities. Everybody's wearing multiple hats. We're like chickens with their head cut off. We're chasing our tail half of the time. 
most modern Christians that I know of struggle in one way, shape, or form with this business of prayer life. But I just want to share something. The Holy Spirit's involved, or he wants to be there too. It's not just, guys, it can't just be about us sucking it up and saying, well, you know what, from now on, I'm going to take five or ten minutes every day and I'm going to pray. Is that abundant life? Does that sound like does that, even, does that even mimic abundant life? I'm just going to slosh through this. By God, I'm going to do it come hell or high water. No. But does the Spirit of God empower us? That's what the Bible says. We don't know how to pray as we should, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. This is the best that NASB can do. Your translation is no better, I can assure you, I've already checked it. Um, the Greek reads, the Holy Spirit intercedes for us with sounds that are inarticulatable by human speech patterns. It's, it's, a, it's a weird, it's a goofy word even in Greek. It's a weird word in Greek. It's kind of a makeup word. It's sort of, you know, how sort of we throw words together and make up a word, a new word that never existed before. That's kind of what Paul's doing here. A la letoi, incapable of human expression. In unable to be expressed in normal human speech patterns. And then Paul adds this thing with sounds, with groanings that can't be articulated in human speech. What does that sound like to you? What does that sound like? What does that sound like Paul is talking about there? Yeah, it's that. Do you hear what they said? There's about 30 or 40 of them. They got it right. The Holy Spirit speaks in sounds. They can be heard, but they can't be understood because they are sounds that are inarticulatable in normal human speech patterns. This is heavenly language. It might be coming out of us, but it doesn't, it doesn't originate in us. It's not a part of our normal human speech pattern. Who is it that Paul says does this? This, this is your own imagination. Is that what that text says? This is just you reverting back to a pre-verbal um, stage in your personal um, human development where babies say goo goo gaga. Is that what Paul is saying here? He's saying this is born of the Spirit of God. This is generated from, this is coming from the Spirit of God. So it's not just our imaginations. They can say that out there. They say a whole lot of things. They've been telling us all kinds of stuff that's crazy. <clears throat> Ice cap receding. That was subliminal. <laughs> you will see the seas recede. Subliminal. Only one I know of is the Dead Sea. Groanings that can't be understood. Groanings that can't be articulated in human speech. Take a look at another one, because that's not all Paul has to say about this. Paul says, if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. It's not coming from here. What's the outcome then? I will pray with the spirit, and I will pray with the mind also. Paul says, if I have this ability to pray in a way that's inspired by the Holy Spirit, what should I do? He says, both. Both. Prayer that you're thinking through and prayer that bypasses the normal thinking processes. Are you aware of the um, experiments that are being done in various places, including Great Britain, 
where uh, people who are engaged in communicating with God uh, using the, the gift of speaking in tongues and they watch, they wire their brains up and then they track this and they see that the different portions of the brain that are lighting up, that are active at these times and it's a completely different lobe of the brain that, by the way, is never used any other time not in emotions, not in normal logic and human speech patterns and that kind of thing. And this is scientifically documented reality. The vast majority of the Pentecostal church has no knowledge of this. When you start talking about it, it's like, oh, wow. Well, um, hey, let's go get ice cream. Um, (laughs) Paul says he's going to be engaged in prayer that is um, empowered by... um, enabled by the Holy Spirit and in prayer where he um, processes things in the same way that we normally do. He says also, I will sing with the Spirit and I will sing with the mind also. We flirted with, especially back in when the charismatic movement was big, this idea of singing in the Spirit. That's not something the charismatics cooked up. That's something that Paul, was, Paul knew about in the first century A.D. The first generation of Christians knew about this stuff. Now, what is it all about and how are we supposed to do it and all? I don't know. You go buy those, get the gurus and buy their manuals. I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know how they know that stuff. Um, but uh, the reality of it is, is that Paul is talking about it right here. It was a known reality in the first century churches. In the book of Jude, we get this little, this, by the way, this is Jesus' half-brother. He grew up in the same family that Jesus grew up in, Jude. He's the son of um, Joseph and Mary, not Mary and God, like Jesus is. So he's half-brother of Jesus, just like James who wrote the book of James, not this James. But you, beloved, building yourself up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit. One of the ways that our faith is built up is going to Israel. I didn't say, did I say that? (laughs) It was subliminal. It's true, though. It's where faith becomes sight. But this, that's not what Jude's saying. He grew up there. He's taking all this for granted, right? Grew up in Galilee, raised in Nazareth. Daddy was a carpenter. You know this. Praying in the Holy Spirit. Some kind of way this guy knew that this practice of praying in the Holy Spirit, again, it's not just gibberish. It increases your... Can you fill in the blank? Pop quizzes are legal. I told you that. It increases your faith, your trust in God. Now, how does that happen? I don't know. I don't know all the answers. I'm just saying Jude knew this. This is part of the divinely inspired word of God. And it's not about gibberish. It's not about gobbledygook. It's not about you just imagining that you're hearing those sounds. This is a reality that the Bible talks about. By the way, it's the same phrase in Greek that Paul is using back in Romans 8. And we talked about Romans 8 a minute ago. <clears throat> Got to move on. We're ending at five minutes ago. Do I need to hurry? <laughs> Thank you, sir. I, I will hasten. The Holy Spirit empowers us to minister to the church. This is not rocket science. I'm just going to run through a bunch of Bible passages. Um, Moses said, I, w- I wish that all of God's people were prophets and the Lord would pour his spirit out on all of them. Doesn't that sound neat? And that's from the book of Numbers. That's from the law of Moses. I want all God's people empowered. I want all God's people speaking spirit-inspired speech. It's practically New Testament. Come on, guys. I want God to put his spirit on all of them. Who's a candidate for infilling of the Holy Spirit? Oh, pastors. Pastors. Bible college graduates. Folks that are ordained. Those slick-haired evangelists got the real shiny shoes, you know, those TV preachers, those kind of guys, they're the ones who need this baptism of the Holy Spirit because it helps them act weirder. Who's a candidate for baptism in the Holy Spirit? 
This promise, Peter said on the day of Pentecost, is to you and your children and all who are afar off, as many as the Lord our God shall call unto himself. I'm quoting Peter in his Pentecost sermon, the the altar call part of it, Acts chapter 2 verse 39. I got a question. Have you been called to him? If you haven't, you're not a Christian. If you're a Christian, you've been called to God. So this promise is of this promise is to you, your children, and all who are afar off. Everybody all the way down through the pages of time, from the first century to the 21st century, from Peter all the way to you and your kids and your grandkids and your great grandkids, as many as the Lord our God shall call to himself. I am a candidate for infilling of the Holy Spirit. I got news for you, whether you knew it or not, so are you. So are you. And so are all your kids, and so is your spouse. So your nieces and your nephews and your neighbors, your best friends here at church, the whole pastoral staff, we're all candidates for God's filling with his spirit because when he calls us to something, walking in life as a follower of Jesus, as a Christian, then he wants to empower us to be optimally successful in walking in that way. He doesn't call where he doesn't provide. He doesn't call where he doesn't empower. (laughs) Joel says, I'm going to pour my spirit out on all mankind. Take a look at this. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Are you seeing a theme crop up that every time that there's spirit empowerment, there's spirit-inspired speech? That's not just true in the book of Acts. That's not just true in the New Testament. That isn't just true in the first century church. That's true all the way back to Moses in the beginning of the thing. Numbers chapter 11. Would that God put his spirit on all of us and that we all prophesy. I'm going to skip this one because we did that one already. God has allotted to each one of us a measure of faith. I've heard people say, well, you know what? I guess I just don't have enough faith. No, the Bible says everybody has a, a measure of faith. God's allotted it to every one of us. You see that in black and white? You see how that changes things? Well, I guess I just don't have enough. No, we've got a measure of faith. Is that a mustard seed? Yeah, a mustard seed can move mountains. You know what? You don't need a whole lot of faith if you've got a great big old big old bad out of the box God. And we do. We do. It's unbelievable what this guy can accomplish. Did you guys see that movie, um, Exodus, Gods and Men? The splitting of the... Okay, go back to Charlton Heston and, and the Ten Commandments. Do you see the, 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 the uh, Red Sea split? That's all Holly Weird is capable of, moving some pieces of jello back and forth. Think of what this God that hung the stars in the sky that really splits red seas and raises people up from the dead and stuff like that can do. I was sitting on a plane watching that thing. I said, oh my goodness, I've missed this all my life, but God, you can do anything. You can do anything. There's nothing that is outside of your purview. There's nothing beyond the scope of your hand. You really can do whatever you get ready to do. Take that to God in prayer and see what happens. You don't need a real big whole bunch of faith if you've got a God that's so big and bad, he can do anything he gets ready. Wow. God has allotted to each one of us a measure of faith. Thank you, Lord, that you have allotted to me a measure of faith. Even when I don't feel like it, the Word of God tells you, nope, sorry, you've got to stop right there in your tracks. You have been given a measure of faith. My Word says so, and I override your feelings. Sorry, Pentecostal. Uh, all members don't have the same function. Why is that? Because we have different gifts. They, uh, they, they differ according to that divine empowerment. This is not about manners. That word grace, charis. You see, see what we're doing now? Verse 6. We have gifts that differ according to God's divine enablement. His infusion of divine power gifts us differently. Is that okay? Yeah, because this is not a competition. We are complementary. We're supposed to be working together. One's a hand, one's a foot. One's a head, one's a, one's a ear. We're all working together as parts of the body of Christ, empowered by the, home, by the same Holy Spirit. To do what? To grow. To be strong. So that all parts of the body are healthy. If in service, serving. If teaching, one who teaches in his teaching. Whoever exhorts in his exhortation. Whoever gives, leads, shows mercy. 
demonstrates cheerfulness to each one, Paul says in 1 Corinthians, and I'm jumping to chapter 12. Romans 12, 1 Corinthians 12. I actually wrote a, an e-book on this, the uh, spiritual giftedness. is that, it was a whole lot of fun. About four people read it. Um, uh, to each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. Really? Does that mean you? Yeah. Does that mean me? Yeah. Does that mean my wife? Yes. Does that mean the guy next to you, the lady next to you? Yes. The whole body of Christ is gifted, spiritually gifted by the Holy Spirit. To do what? To strengthen the entirety, the whole, so that we're all playing the part we're supposed to play. Word of wisdom, word of knowledge, verse 9, faith, gifts of healing, miracles, prophecy, distinguishing of spirits, various kinds of of tongues. I've been able to isolate approximately eight different ways that tongues function. We talked about one, intercession. There's another that's uh, edifying, building up your most holy faith. There's six more at least that I've, I've found. It's in that book that the other four people have read. Um, the Spirit works all of these things just as He wills. It's not you know what, I, I, that prophecy thing's really cool. You know, I've heard what they're doing over in Kansas City. Um, I want to get in on a little bit of that gravy. That's not your call. The Holy Spirit apportions as he wills. Um, last time I checked, basketball teams need one center. You know basketball? The biggest guy that stands there guarding the basket uh, they don't need five centers. They need guards. They need forwards. They need people who can pass and dribble and shoot, block shots, play defense. We are a team. We are a body. And God wants to equip each one of us to do the part that we need to play in this, on this team. You know, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 12, if, if one member suffers, all suffer. And I'm just here to tell you, that's true at, at altar time when we need to identify and pray for one another, but that's not what Paul was talking about. He was saying when one of the spiritual gifts suffer, then the entire body, like a human body, if one kidney's malfunctioning, that's going to have a deleterious, a negative effect on other parts of the body. You see what he's doing here? This is 1 Corinthians 12. He's talking about spiritual gifts. He's not talking about praying for people who are hurting um, emotionally at the altar. We can, by extension, apply it to that. But Paul's original point is this business of God empowering the body of Christ to function as the different parts or different members of the body of Christ. It says he wills. The Holy Spirit empowers us to witness. And I'm just going to give you one, and then we're going to go to prayer. Is that all right? Jesus told his original apostles. Now, these guys had been with him for about three, three and a half years. He had lived with them, slept with them, eaten with them, traveled with them, trained them. And yet he says in Luke 24, I want you to stay in this city. You pray and you wait until you are empowered by the Holy Spirit. And you, when you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. He picks the narrative up in Acts chapter 1. What he left off in Luke 24, he picks up. Same author, Luke, in the book of Acts chapter 1. When the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses. Do you see there? You've got spirit empowerment and then you've got spirit-inspired speech. This time in a witness context. Not in a prophecy context, not in a tongues context, but in a witness context. Through the, throughout the entire Old Testament, almost every instance where the Holy Spirit comes upon someone or infuses someone with power, one exception is Samson. He's quite the exception to almost every rule. He's who you, you don't want your kids to grow up to be like. Um, he's a chief uh, cartoon character in the book of Judges, the cartoon network of the Old Testament. That's a whole other sermon. But um, uh, almost every instance when someone is filled with the Holy Spirit... In the Old Testament, the next thing that follows is spirit-inspired, spirit-enabled, spirit-empowered speech because God has raised us up to be his spokespersons in the way we live and in the way we speak. 
you will be my witnesses, starting in Jerusalem and ending up in the ends of the earth, kind of where we sit right now today. So I do have this one point that I want to make, and that's for all of you Pentecostals who got it back in ought 11, you know, or who uh, were filled with the Spirit at my grandma's knee in that old clapboard church down in the country, or that uh, uh, pastor or that, you know, uh, elderly saint who, yep, I've been speaking in tongues for 50 years or whatever. I've got, I've got a really important word, and we're going to conclude with this. In Acts 4, 8, Peter had already been filled with the Spirit in Acts 2 on the day of Pentecost, but it said Peter stood up and being filled with the Holy Spirit. He got it again. He needed it again. He's that cracked earthen vessel. He's that imperfect, incomplete, sloshed around vessel, and he needed refilling. In Acts chapter 4, verse 31, it happens to the whole church. And guess what happens next? And they spoke the word of the Lord with boldness. You'll get it in the very next verse. In Acts chapter 7, Stephen, a man who was full of grace, charis, and of the Holy Spirit, is filled with the Spirit right before he is martyred. In Acts 13, verse 9, Paul, who is filled with the Holy Spirit in Acts 9, stands up in a, in a church who is, um, that is fill, uh, not a church, in a synagogue filled with traditional Jewish people. And it says, and he stood up and he was filled with the Holy Spirit. The same Paul that was filled in Acts 9 is filled again in Acts 13. And Paul then puts this, the cap on it in Ephesians 5. And he says, don't be drunk with wine but be continually filled with the Holy Spirit. The Bible, the first century Christians, that first generation of Jesus followers knew this is an absolute necessity. And so what I want to do is I want to remove this idea of once filled, always filled. If I could, if I could excise that from your minds and help you to see the same thing that was going on in the book of Acts with these first century Christians, we need to be continually refilled. One tank of gas is not going to get us to the finish line. One charge of the battery is not going to get us to the end of the race. God wants us continually filled, enabled, empowered to live these kinds of lives, to accomplish these impossible things that he regularly calls us to. So I want to invite those of you who have never been filled with the Holy Spirit if you've seen some value in this, and this is connected to your spirit, and the Spirit of God has quickened this to you, and you have said, um, uh, I see this in the Word, and I need that. Yes, I got saved by the, spirit, the help of the Spirit of God, but I need to be brought to the finish line by the same Holy Spirit of God. I'd love to pray for you. But it, even as, as much as, as, as important as that is, I would love to see people who are needing a fresh touch of God's Spirit, a re infilling of God's Spirit, filled years ago, maybe filled last week. We're still candidates this week. So I want to invite you as well. And when we pray together, you just tell me which it is, and we will go for that, okay?